Hey everybody, so we are going to be continuing the trend that I started last summer, which is reviewing books from the knowledge graph and semantics space. And the reason I do this is because so many of you ask me what books I would recommend if you are just getting started or if you want to learn more information about semantics. So that is what we're going to be doing for the whole month of June this year. And today we are going to be reviewing that book and with all of these reviews, I always give away my review copy uh, to someone in the audience. So if you are interested in that, make sure you check the description down below for more details. All right, so with that, let's go get started. So I'm Ricky, Ricky Sang. I'm a Silicon Valley IT veteran. Uh, over the past 25, 26 years, I've been like uh, working in the Valley, uh, particularly in the high tech industry. And right now I'm running a startup called Altipan. And I was actually trying to look for a textbook, a reference book we can, you know, we can refer to, but other than graph theory, which you're going to, yeah. if you were majored in computer science, you're going to, you're going to read that, you know, in mm -hmm. your undergraduate years, but I don't find anything as comprehensive, as practical as possible. Mm -hmm. So I decided to, you know, write a book and share with the world. So that was, you know, like I the love beginning. that. No, I love that. And and you know that I love when uh, books of this nature come out from a needs perspective, right? You went out and you had a need, and you were like, "Well, there's got to be something out here." And when you found there wasn't anything up to what you were looking for, you said, "You know what? I'm going to fill that gap." And then I yeah. I loved it. Um, a lot of the the different things that you're going over here are all represented in this. I was I was actually pleasantly surprised with all of the different facets of graph that you went into. Not only did you talk about you know the the different queries you can use and like what is a graph, how do you set up the architecture, right? But even like the last chapter, which I I will just saying I will continue to keep referring people to that chapter, is about um, how do you do benchmarking on some of these things, because a lot of people, because you're talking about efficiencies and, you know, multi hub queries. And in, if you don't, if you don't model your data, right, those still could be not efficient. <laughs> right. And okay. so, you know, being able to benchmark is, is a really key component to, you know, if you are doing this for efficiency sake or cutting costs, so you don't want to do like a million joins or have a query that runs multiple days, that sort of thing. Um, you want to be able to then measure that and put your money where your mouth is. Um, so I really do appreciate that you you went through that. And um, I know we were talking off camera uh, before this, so I'll say it on camera, which is um, even though I'm, I'm very much uh, ingesting lots of data and text on an everyday basis to you know keep up with everything and learn, I do also really love, especially with graph visual examples and visually showing things. Like even when you're describing things, right, Ricky, you're like this thing and this thing, and you're like doing the the visual piece. And there is a ton of really good visuals in, in the book. I keep going this way because I have it right here <laughs> um, that, that I really did enjoy. And so I, I really do think that um, this is, this is going to be great for folks that really want to dive in. Um, I, I think it does do a really good job of going at a high level, but then giving you those jumping off points to go really deep if you really want to. Um, which which I do appreciate. So, Ricky, when when you if 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 you're talking through this with with folks, like what are some of the the tips that you would give, um, especially for anyone picking this book up? Um, they're just getting into graph. They're just getting into okay. Now I need to pick a graph database, or I need a graph architecture. Um, what are some tips that you would give folks uh, to start learning about that, either from this book or things outside of the book that would help them, you know, merge into this? Right, right. You know, I, I think uh, if you remember, recall, you know, chapter one, I think I specifically designed chapter chapter one to talk about graph thinking because, you know, mm -hmm. like we talk to customers, prospects, you know, like um, we, we and I think the number one thing sometimes which can be very frustrating to me, you know, like to pitch them, like what graph is. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people really forget about graph thinking. You know, it's a way of thinking, right? Right. I'm so lot, glad you like, highlight like, that. Yeah. Totally. Yes. Uh, so I think you know, to get the right kind of thinking, I'm not saying the other kind of thinking are wrong, but just like 
Graph thinking is high dimensional. It's like connective. We are talking about connectivities, relationships, uh, which in my opinion is genuinely uh, relational. It's more relational. It's than more relational, relational than the thing called relational. Total, totally. I, th I think there are, there are a lot, which is a fact, a lot more people who are familiar with the relational, I mean, the tables, you know, columns and yes. rows, than the graph thinking or the graph database yeah. or the graph data modeling. Now, this is very typical. Some, uh, for instance, like in the banking financial industries, we, we do see a lot of transactions flowing in, you know, mm -hmm. every day. And those transactions can be relationships and accounts and cards can be nodes, you know, entities. So mm -hmm. then we got a gigantic tra transactional network that is very naturally represented. And also, in now, once you have this kind of network, you can do a lot of things like mm -hmm. fraud detection. But mm -hmm. beyond fraud detection, we also talk about, you know, smart marketing, recommendation, you know, auditing, and even like asset liability management, liquidity risk management. I mean, there are just a whole slew of uh, scenarios can be built, you know, using the graph data models we just mentioned, you know, which mm -hmm. can be exponentially more efficient. And, but and I why think, are they more know, efficient, I, though? Because I mean, yeah. so so the reason I push on some of these is because sometimes these are fluffy words, right? Like, oh, it's it's faster, it's more efficient, but why? Why is it more efficient? Totally, totally. Well, then we have to we have to talk about a little bit, you know, technical things, you know, like when when we say we have a tables, you know, like columns and rows, and sometimes you you know the C code there there are a lot of like normalization kind of things you know, mm -hmm. when you are trying to gain insights you know out of this data you probably will have to join multiple tables exactly then you know it's just almost out of control from data governance data lineage perspective that makes things so much more challenging yep. and also especially when you join multiple tables together mm -hmm. you're gonna you're going to experience something called a Cartesian product that basically just the computational complexity is so high, making relational database very difficult to, you know, to retrieve data out of it or retrieve insights, getting results out of it. And, but how can we lower the computational complexity? Mm -hmm. Lower comp computational complexity means there's a huge potential to be able to run things so much faster mm -hmm. and, and can be exponentially faster. So let's talk about graph. Assume, let's, let me give you one very specific scenario. For instance, like, you know, start from one account and this is like your bank card. And from that account, you are trying to figure out, you know, like, how many transactions you conducted, or for instance, like you, let's just say one-way transaction, you're mm -hmm. transferring money out of your bank, your bank account. Mm -hmm. One hop means, you know, trying to find all the, all the parties who were, mm -hmm. you know, dealing with you or the recipients of the money, you know, mm -hmm. the transaction, transacted money. And what if you repeat this kind of traversal for like five hops mm -hmm. or three hops or two hops? which means you're going to have to recursively, you know, assuming over the past month you you conducted transactions with 10 people or 10 accounts. Mm -hmm. And those 10 accounts each conducted another 10 transactions. So the second hop, you're going to find 100 accounts. The deeper you go, I mean, like you go multiple hops and deeper, deeper, yeah. then the computational complexity will be unbearable if you are yeah. still using relational database. And using graph, it's very much like linear, you know, like mm -hmm. just a sort of, a, but definitely shouldn't be exponential. That would be too much. Mm -hmm. All right. So outside of these tips, like what are some of the things that you would say are hurdles or things to just watch out for when you're getting into uh, graph databases and things that you wish maybe you knew when you were getting into it. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I guess the then I think we should talk about the chapter two and chapter three. Because uh, one, there there are a lot of the books, you know, textbooks on databases, basically yeah. just the relational database or no SQL, you know, not only SQL databases. And when I reading through all those books, you know, I think it like I read maybe a few dozen, maybe mm -hmm. like up to 100 books. What really, you know, to my perspective, like I only see, you know, those books talking about storage, storage mm -hmm. engine. Mm -hmm. When they 
design a database, you know, they specifically designed the storage engine. There was no mentioning about the compute engine, the computing, you know. And there's a reason. Because, you know, tables just uh, can be, you know, persisted on the file system on, you know, on the disks yeah. and don't worry about anything else because all the data are basically stored in a very discreet way, you know, like it's a, uh, so, but once you have all the data stored in or modeled, you know, in a related, I mean, connected way, you know, nodes and edges, especially the edges, then you're going to have to think about computing, you know, because the computing will be the key to lower, mm -hmm. you know, the, I should say not only to lower the, the complexity, but also to accelerate when you traverse. Yeah. If you if, if we can't traverse deeply, there is no point of designing, you know, yet another graph database. Yeah. So, you know, so I think when I was writing the book, I specifically, you know, uh, set up a, a separate, a dedicated chapter for graph computing, mm -hmm. how to design the graph computing engine, how that is different from traditional, you know, previous generation of databases. I, uh, I, I love that. that. Yeah. Again, like That's... I wish this book had existed years ago because I remember when I was uh, starting out uh, my very first big graph architectural project and I was the graph expert on staff and I was working with a lot of enterprise uh, architects. And I remember talking about graph databases and graph traversal and there's interfaces, right? Like in, in most of these, these graph databases to set up. And I mean, you don't need to, I mean, you can, you know, for sure, just use your Jupyter notebooks and do your own like thing. But a lot of the tools and, and databases come with ways to do that computing. Um, and I remember like talking about this to like the main architect and he just gave me the most blank stare. And he's like, it's a database. <laughs> and I'm like, but it's, but it's not just storage. Right. And it's, it was only that moment, Ricky, that I was like, because I grew up doing graph, like from the very first day I stepped into my classroom, I was doing graph, even though graph was not the sexy thing back then, not a lot, not a lot of people were using it. I think there was only like maybe a few handful of graph databases out at the time and nobody was talking about them. Uh, but I, I've always thought graph and I've always used graph databases and, and so I guess seeing it from that other perspective of someone coming in and not having used graph, it's like, yeah, but it's just storage. It's like, oh, here's a, so to me, I'm like, oh, good. Let's talk about that. It's not. And that's why it's exciting. That makes me really happy that you <laughs> talked about that in your book, because I think a lot of people really appreciate that. Um, maybe a lot of folks that are having that moment, like I did a few, well, not a few at this point, a while back uh, years ago when I had that ex experience, but and that's the other thing. Like, what are some of those misconceptions? Um, I know that uh, I have heard myself, a lot of engineers. Now, this was before LLM space, right? Where I was talking to a lot of engineers and like, yeah, you know, graph. That's like, you don't really need it. It's just like this fancy thing on the side that you maybe do just for like recommendation engines or something. Um, now that LLMs are in the mix and people know that graph really assists in, um, you know, doing things with your LLM. I think more and more people are getting exposure to it and interesting uh, things are happening because of that. But what are some of the misconceptions that you see, Ricky, that are still kind of persisting out there? Yeah, well, this is a great question. I think a common misconception is that a lot of people view graph database are only useful for social networks. Uh, you know, like I think that was like 10 years ago, a lot of people would talk about that, you know, all the time. Mm -hmm. In reality, uh, I think graph database have much broader mm -hmm. you know, applications, not just not only recommendation engines or strictly fraud detection, building solutions in the areas like, you know, real time liquidity risk management, which which were never heard of, you know, like in the Oracle days, you know, mm -hmm. you're not able to do real time because like I mentioned, you know, the Cartesian product, the tables mm -hmm. to process hundreds of millions of data, you know, rows of data in real time. That's just unbelievable. Mm -hmm. It's impossible. And also like asset liability management, treasury management, auditing, supply mm -hmm. chain management. Remember the supply chain is a gigantic network, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. raw materials to where, you know, to suppliers, to products, to data to warehouses and to the merchants, to shop, to shelves, you know, it's a, it's a network. 
mm-hmm. all things are connected. Mm-hmm. And we are seeing more and more scenarios that can be optimized, upgraded, or disruptively, you know, reinvented using graph database. Yeah. I mean, that's the whole that's the whole thing about digital transformation. Basically, everything will be transformed. And, and you mentioned yeah. LLM. So we are seeing on the one hand, you know, graph database can be augmented with yeah. LLM, like the NLP capability. Well, vice versa, right? Great. The LLM can be augmented yeah. by graph. Yeah, exactly. It's a two way. It's a bi-directional mm-hmm. augmentation and acceleration. And yeah, so. Yeah, and 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 I'm, I'm so excited to see where the space goes. I mean, don't get me wrong. There's all kinds of other hurdles in the LLM <laughs> space that we got to figure out. Um, but I do feel like at least folks are looking at graph as, you know, um, a way to solve for some of those issues, <laughs> not all, you can't only do so much on ethics with graph. Um, you gotta, you gotta do some things on your own, uh, to figure that out, but all right, Ricky. So, uh, closing remarks, like what, so if, you know, somebody is noodling on whether they want to pick up this book. Um, what What are some, wh- why would you um, encourage someone to pick up the book other than you wrote it? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Uh, uh, there are probably a cu- couple of points. Number one, I, I should, uh, we should say it's a book about comprehensive understanding about graph or graph databases. I think it covers, you know, the essentials like, um, you know, bridging the gap for beginners and experts like, you know, like mm-hmm. we, we talk about storage, compute, mm-hmm. query language, and, and also applications, mm-hmm. and also how we design a horizontally scalable architecture, and also benchmarking, you know, results, validation, verification, all those mm-hmm. kind of things, mm-hmm. you know, uh, it's quite comprehensive, number one. Uh, number two, I think, uh, I provided quite a bit of a you know practical insights mm-hmm. with real world examples you know and best mm-hmm. practice you know I I think that can really guide the users help the the readers in making informed decisions mm-hmm. and also the the third thing is I I think I I put in a lot of a unique perspectives the other mm-hmm. people probably don't want to talk about like results validation because yeah. I, I think. If you don't have real world experiences, you're not going to be able to talk about that. Because yeah. even today, a lot of the databases, some some claiming they can do graph, graph computer, graph database, are still churning out results which could be wrong. So you know, mm. like uh, it could be hurtful to understand that. But I think it's important because yeah. at the end of the day, we we always want white box explainability. We yes, can't really exactly. talk, you know, black box, unexplainable, you know, bad accuracy, all those kind of things. Yeah. 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 And those things are so critical, um, especially since some of the a lot of the um, use cases you you've kind of touched on are financial or even like some insurance and some other things that kind of um, make their way into uh, supply chain. Uh, you you have to have that explainability. Um, but, you know, it's it's important to have fair data video up above if you don't know what fair data is, but basically you you need to be able to explain why you got the results that you did, because if you are going in front of uh, a regulator or court, you know, for some reason, um, or, you know, you are identifying uh, a person or entity of some sort as a bad actor, you have to have really strong arguments for those things. And not knowing what's happening in the back end of your um, database and your queries and whether you can trust the data you have, that's pretty critical in these situations. <laughs> um, so, so I would thoroughly agree with that. 